Welcome everybody to Grand Tactician The Civil War. We are doing the Union Campaign finally on the 1.0 release. You can see it right here folks. The game has officially released. We are going to play it on the very hard mode, the hardest mode possible. Um, I do want to kind of get things started by looking at the game options and we want to make sure we want to do European interventions on Fog of War is on, order delays are on, and something that I haven't seen a ton talked about, but is a very interesting feature, Feuds is clicked on. Now, something we are going to try to do a little special with our campaign is we have um, opened up the policy decision making to the general public. And we did a poll on uh, my Patreon page, and we have decided, if you want to go visit that Patreon page and look at the results of the poll, you may do so. The link will be in the description. But we have decided on, click on Breadbasket was one of them, Go West, and Union and Pacific. So those are our three policies. Go West, encourage people to move to the west coast of the United States, northern support in California and Oregon plus 25, population plus 20%, and recruitment made possible in said states. The trade capacity of the Santa Fe and Oregon trails doubled. So you get a lot of different benefits from that. Trade benefits, population benefits, which means more manpower, the port benefits, you also have Breadbasket, a policy for America to feed the world. All farms will start the campaign with a higher upgrade level. Relations with Europe plus 10. This policy is required for level 3 and 4 agriculture policy. So we need to feed our vast armies and Breadbasket is going to help achieve that. Union and Pacific Railroad support the construction of the Union Pacific Railroad connecting the Atlantic and Pacific coasts will increase trade with the western states. The game will start with the Union Pacific Railroad built and Union controlling trade to the Pacific coast. Union credit rating plus 2, railroad transfer capacity and construction speed plus 25%. We do want to set our AI bonus to max level. We're going to do plus 50. Difficulty is going to be very hard. So the difference is mainly from what I have gathered from the manual and discussions on the Grand Tactician website is that the bonus is a cheat bonus. So it is basically an AI cheat bonus. Um, affecting mostly national morale and I believe morale of the armies themselves. Difficulty on very hard gives the a more aggressive AI behavior. Now I'm wondering too, sometimes with a more aggressive AI though, especially if you're the Confederacy, I wonder if it just ends up being more detrimental to them as if they might, they may make some rash and audacious decisions, but that was true, especially in the Eastern Theater, Robert E. Lee making some very audacious decisions to invade the North as he did on not once but tw two occasions, splitting a smaller force in the face of a larger force. So could create some interesting gameplay to say the least. So we are doing spring of 1861, plus 50 bonus, difficulty very hard. We've got our policies inset. Well, why don't we start this campaign? So for current subscribers, you're probably pretty familiar already with the user interface of the game. But for newer folks that might be getting more interested in the game as it has been officially released. If you start at the spring of 1861 start, the nation is not yet in war. James Buchanan is the pre president of the United States um, and Lincoln has not yet been inaugurated. He has been voted in and the southern states begin to secede. Now, certain policies can affect who actually secedes and who doesn't, especially in the border states, especially concerning Kentucky, 
Missouri and Kansas, there's some policies that will help determine what those states will do. Again, the policies affecting Kentucky, the Confederates can choose a policy that will give support benefits to Kentucky and especially Kansas too. But the Union also has counter policies that may you can go all in for trying to persuade other states to join the Southern cause, but if the Union also picks Kansas a Union state that will often lead Kansas to stay Union. So there is a historical bias in that sense. Um, you have the date up top, you have the manpower up top, fielded, fielded manpower, and the tooltips do give you an awful lot of information in the game. So those are they are very useful. And you have your current treasury, treasury and surplus, your current debt rating, railroad and sea capacity, and you have your menu bar. You have your strategy tab, current commander of all forces, commanding general. So the Winfield Scott, even though he's not holding a field command, he is basically your He's basically your chief of army. Also in the finances tab is where you can set some financial policies in place. So there's a quick overview here of national debt, interest rates, credit rating. So this is important to keep an eye on. The higher the debt and the lower the budget surplus, the worse the rating will be. Better ratings lead to lower interest rates. If ratings are too low, the issuing of debt is not possible anymore. I believe in earlier versions it said anything below a triple B. I wonder if that has changed slightly to a more dynamic setting. You do have sliders and there are subsidies sliders here. You have a politics slider, diplomacy slider, industry. So you can basically with all these sliders you can increase subsidies and spending to impact how fast and how much industry your cities build. Same thing with agriculture, transportation will go into the tra transportation pool. Recruitment will affect, of course, availability of volunteers and drafts. Civil order will help port in states. Loss of state support due to raiding, drafting, combat losses is reduced. Intelligence gathering and approval. So this also affects intelligence gathering, something I think I had not realized uh, that civil order affects. So politics affects the, another, uh, the amount of additional policies that you can have in place. So if we go look at the policies tabs. We have zero of five enacted right now. We have our historical ones, or not our historical, the ones that we chose at the beginning of the campaign. So go west, that's active. Fred Basket is active, and... Union and Pacific Railroad are active. So those are kind of like overriding policies in place. Then you have the in-game policies. Funding, agriculture, industry, military, and diplomacy. And right now we have we can have up to five policies enacted. With the subsidies, we can add additional policies. So it will cost us 200000 So you can see that it went up to... To six. Now, the discussion that most people are having is that it's really not beneficial until you are have hit five policies. So you're, it feels like you're wasting money by adding additional policies when you're not even researched your max number of policies. If I am wrong about this and there is some benefit that I am not seeing to adding additional policies ahead of time, Please let, uh, feel free to leave a comment. So I believe the, the union has the advantage of, well, they have a lot of advantages. They have the advantage of um, already having a stronger industry, manpower, uh, maybe not necessarily breadbasket, but I would, I would wager that the historical situation that the union was able to outproduce food because the South was more into cash crops than food crops, where their whole economy was based on production of cash crops instead of actual foodstuffs. So 
The union should have already natural advantages to industry agriculture funding. We are going to start though and ramp up our own industrialization. So we're going to research and start off with industrialization one. We are only going to research the one policy at the moment because it should research faster that way. We're actually going to test that out. Let's, let's play the campaign. American, America divided. President Buchanan unable to solve the crisis. Jefferson Davis to lead the Confederacy. Texas votes three to one to secede. General Twiggs surrenders U.S. armaments. Let's go back to policies. So before when we had two policies going, or one policy going, it was at 33 days. It's now 72.8 days to research both policies if you have two policies going at the same time it's going to delay the amount of uh, time or it's going to increase the amount of time it's going to take to research the policy we're just going to keep it on industrialization one it's even more than it's even more than twice the amount and that's probably due to minus 26 percent research speed due to lower state support minus 53 research speed as multiple policies are researched. So yeah, it, it actually, it's more than twice the time added if you try to research two policies at the same time. So far, best, the best policy is to only research one policy at a time. I suppose if you're trying to rush something through, maybe, also, if you were getting a research bonus in speed due to national support, that might be the way to go with faster research, but that is usually not the case. Before we start recruiting armies, we will take a look at our Navy first. So you have the home squadron. You have the squadron that you have selected right here, the fleet selected. You also have ships in harbor that are not assigned to any fleet. Um, there is a differentiation between sea and river fleets. Um, a lot of ships also have the movement type for both. Now, playing as the Union side, you're going to have a lot of ships that are able to travel the blue water, deep sea regions. So the home squadron, squadron that is our basis for the Atlantic fleet. There are no other fleets right now available, although we have a lot of ships in harbor. So we can create fleets, although a lot of these ships, you can see on the right hand side the condition they are in, like the John Hancock, which is a steamship, can travel through sea and rivers. It's only 36% completed, 36% ready for um, ready for action. I do want to create a new fleet. And it's actually we're going to create our river fleet. So why don't we start building our fleet out of Cairo, Illinois. It's a level one port. So we can use these steamers to maybe start creating the basis for our new river fleet. You just click and drag over. So we only have four steam river steamers that are in harbor. I'm going to hold on to these other two for operations along the Atlantic seaboard. Because really, the one weakness I guess the Union Navy might have here is a lack of river flotilla. So we're going to have to build that from scratch. As all these other ships are seagoing ships. It would be great for the... Um, blockade that we are going to institute having worked his way from midshipman to commissioned officer he can be given a command of a ship or a squadron All right, we're going to assign him to the river fleet we're going to construct some new ships now port size is going to restrict some of the ships that we are able to build out out of cairo Although we can build this second rate steamer, even though it says we need a level two port required. We're gonna build this nine gun second rate steamer. Then maybe we can build a few ships tender gunboat. Or maybe a timber clad? General Grant. You know, let's do a couple paddle steamers. 
So we got quite a few ships being built at the Cairo Harbor. Why don't we assign some of these seagoing ships to quadrants that we will be used to institute the blockade on the Confederates. We'll have them all ready for the blockade once the war starts. Here's the home squadron. And the home squadron we will rebase at Hampton. So no movement allowed pre-war. So that is a feature before the war actually starts. No movement. So what we could do is just divide up our ships in harbor into and create a new fleet. So we have uh, ports on the Great Lakes, which would be kind of interesting if we did a, eight, a War of 1812. If you did a War of 1812 mod or game based off this engine, you can do a recreate the Battle of Lake Erie. This will create a new fleet out of New London, Connecticut. The Vermont. All right, this fleet looks to be ready. All right, nine ships. Assign Theodorus Bailey as the commander of that fleet. All right, so we have two fleets. Let me do another one. We'll name it Blockade, Blockade One, Blockade Fleet One. Not a not a flashy name, but it'll help me keep track of the blockade. When we do a smaller fleet out of Key West, Steam Sloop. All right, that should be good for Smith Squadron or let's do George Pearson, maybe. Uh, how about Dupont? This will probably be the Gulf Fleet. All right, we'll hold the rest of the ships in kind of a reserve for now until we see how things develop. Probably going to need to build more. Probably going to need to build more seagoing vessels as well. Let's get the game going off to a fast start because we want to get to the actual. War start. Jefferson Davis inaugurated president for six years. Confederacy seizing U.S. property. State militias mobilizing. Union issues bonds. Detailed information about the issue. So in the 1861 spring campaign, you go through a bunch of the events that lead up to the Civil War. This is where a lot of your policies will have an impact Especially the support policies like Kansas, a free state policy that will trigger and affect how the states react to secession. So we have loyalties in Missouri torn, secessionist Minutemen mustered, Missouri volunteer militia formed, Governor Jackson preparing for secession, unconditional uh, union party formed. Kentucky vows to remain neutral. Governor McGoffin, a Southern sympathizer, secession gaining uh, support. Union unionists rallying supporters. Neutrality not realistic if war rips. That kind of seems Kentucky might fall to the Confederates. Actually, we did not see what policies the Confederates had. We have Old Dominion, Southern industrialization. An arms agent. Those are actually pretty good for the Confederacy. Old Dominion, Virginia votes to secede from the Union and will join the Confederacy. The Confederate capital is moved from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. Confederate support in Virginia plus 10. Virginia secession and Richmond's close proximity to Washington, D.C. comes as a shock to Union citizens. Union morale minus 5. Southern industrialization. All heavy industries will start the campaign with a higher upgrade level. The Confederacy will start the campaign with more railroad lines built and immigration from Europe increases population within the Confederacy by 25%, but lowers unity due to religious unrest and resentment towards slavery within the immigrant population. Reducing national morale by minus five. This policy is required for level three or four industrialization policies and the abolition of slavery later in the campaign. Arms agents organize movement of weapons to southern armories and forts. The number of weapons available to the Confederacy is increased by 50%. The Springfield weapon types become 
available for production in South's industry union morale minus five. So that let's look at the start of the strategic situation. Confederate slight advantage right off the bat. So you have the deep so southern states have seceded, including Texas. Well, the front lines are drawn here, even though war has not yet officially been declared. Union support in Virginia is down to 26%. North Carolina, 21. 60% in Kentucky. Missouri is 60% for Union. Kansas, 60%. Most of the northern states are 80 to 85%. All right, Fort Sumter situation deteriorates. Beauregard takes command. The Fort Garrison is low on supplies. More siege artillery moved to Charleston. We are going to create our first army, and that is going to be the Army of the Potomac. Now, using the filters, we can find a suitable commander. Now, part of this campaign is we will, I will open up the decision on who will be the main commander in the Eastern Theater, also in the Midwest and in the West. So the three main commanders in the three major theaters of operations. There'll be side theaters as well, uh, but to keep the flow of the campaign going. So we're gonna choose an army commander. Um, now we will are going to decide on a, a an official army commander um, from the viewers yourself. Well, I'll create a new poll for Eastern, Midwestern, and Western theater commanders. For now, we're just going to assign someone that can start maybe building some depots and telegraph stations so that we can start maybe building some of the infrastructure for war now and get ahead our, of ourselves before we start launching our invasion into the secession south. So, looking for commanders with a engineer branch of arms will help create field works faster. And this makes the unit better in siege warfare and constructing or overcoming obstacles. Richard Delafield will get a, a slight promotion there. We're going to change our unit size of infantry for now, just as small. These units will be ready in about half a month or so they are stationed near Annapolis they won't be able to move until war is declared anyways so Texas officially joins the Confederacy new territories organized the maps are updated borders have moved fulfilling the manifest destiny Davis calls from militia 12-month contracts provisional army formed states recruiting new regiments Call of arms made. Lincoln inaugurated the 16th president of the United States. New cabinet to handle crisis. Buchanan leaves office. Virginia's loyalty to union question. Rumors of increasing support for the secession. Further state states threatening to leave the union. Confederate support in Virginia soars. So Confederate states have established an army. Organization pattern after U.S. Army. Davis authorized to call up 100,000 men. Regular Army of 16,000 men planned. Speech delivered in Savannah. Stevens addresses the nation. Cornerstone address. New government foundations laid. Further secession predicted. Industrialization one policy selected. More support for union factories. John Erickson's monitor design approved. Mass production of new weapon types. So industrialization has been researched. Our research speech minus 22% due to lower state. Well, that's because we still have southern states that uh, have low support for us affecting that research. Suppose we can go to military one and research that in 32 days. We want to do militia act one. Oh, we can enact that in 12.9 days. So why don't we do Militia Act 1, and then try to do Militia Act 2 to get the 12-month volunteers, 12-month militias. Military 1, military policies allow new laws for recruitment, increase the subsidies, but Militia Act 1 will allow the president has the authority to call in the militia to form a provisional army 
but only if the nation is under attack. This act will allow the recruitment of volunteer units under a three-month contract. It will be considered an act of war by the CSA and will increase their morale. If not activated before Fort Sumter is attacked, this act will be activated without delay. Oh, so why don't we just wait for Fort Sumter? We'll go with Militia at, or Military Act 1 instead. Sure Militia Act 1 will be instantly acted once Fort Sumter fires. The Confederates enact Industrialization 1 policy. Could be upgrading our depots. If we want to secure Western Virginia, we can upgrade that depot. Now again, I don't plan on losing Harper's Ferry and the Shenandoah Valley. But we may temporarily lose them. I don't want to upgrade the depot here yet until I know it's secured and won't because it'll leave me as soon as Virginia secedes. Can upgrade the Washington depot. It's not a lot of depots anywhere. Beauregard issues ultimatum. Major Anderson refuses to surrender at 4:30 a.m. a.m. Fort Johnston opens fire. Fort Sumter bombarded. Fort Sumter surrendered. 3,000 Confederates rounds were fired. No casualties from bombardment. President Lincoln to call militia. Civil war has commenced. Civil war. Further southern states secede. Confederate armies on the move. European reluctant to take sides. New campaign objectives. So here we go. War has officially been declared. Why don't we pause? I was told, okay, see, yep, Militia Act 1 is checked. Already, already one Confederate invasion, Missouri State Guard. Please don't tell me the Army of Shenandoah is forming in Pennsylvania. Why don't we... Let's speed this up a day. Front lines did change. We have most of Kentucky. I, we are going to have to start... Forming some armies here. All right, so at the, at the start of the war, we do have armies created for us to begin. Army of Northeastern Virginia, Department of Pennsylvania, Department of the Ohio, and Department of West. So here we have the start of the campaign. We need to decide who is going to command the Army of the West because it's not going to be Harney. Before we move on, I will open up the voting for you, the viewers, to decide on the early war generals for the three major theaters of the war. You can follow the links in the description to vote. You can vote three times. The top three generals will be chosen. They will be assigned to the army based on their home state. So if you have a general... That's home state is, let's take an example here. Where's McDowell located? So McDowell's home state is Ohio. So he would take the command of the Army of Ohio. Now, there are several generals from several from the same state. So we'll make a decision based on that if that were to happen. Also, I'm going to limit the selection to colonel or higher. Voting will end end of the day Thursday. We'll do follow-up votes to replace commanders that we are unhappy with if we so choose. So, again, viewer involvement will be greatly appreciated and welcome. I hope you enjoy the rest of this series. I hope, I hope you enjoy this introduction to the Union campaign. I will list the generals available um, in the links down below. You can take a look at um, who you can choose from.